This is the Jeff Santos Show on the Revolution Radio Network. Rebuilding America together. Now, here's Jeff. 33 minutes past the hour. It is indeed the Jeff Santo Show that you are tuned into. We are here every Monday through Friday from 3 to 6 Eastern Time, 12 to 3 Pacific. And, of course, uh, you can check us out on Revolution Radio Network anytime you want. You can listen to podcasts, fresh podcasts, coming up off of today's show at 6.30 p.m. Again, you can listen around the clock uh, until we are live back next Monday at 3 Eastern uh, 12 Pacific, and uh, check it out from there. Uh, we're going to be talking with our good friend Mark Taylor Canfield coming up, the Renaissance man of the Jeff Santo Show. And I, um, you know, I I look at all of this situation right now, and and folks, uh, you know, we're we're lucky to have the contributors that we do, and you know, the fact that they are uncovering so many different things, and our next guest is uh, sort of an epitome of that. Uh, as I have always said, he's a Renaissance man because he can he can do a million things, and he's going off in in a number of, uh, of amazing and interesting uh, sort of directions. But uh, witnessing as a journalist um, some of the disgusting scenarios of our federal government um, in terms of how we're treating um, people coming across the border. Uh, is is something that uh, good friend Mark Taylor Canfield just found uh, out about by by hopping on a Greyhound bus. And let's talk to our good friend, uh, the uh, Renaissance man of the Jeff Santos Show, investigative journalist. Our uh, of course he's a great musician himself, and he's a, a guest every Friday here on the Jeff Santos Show. How you doing, Mister Mark? How are you? I'm doing okay, Jeff. It has been a very busy day, and I. I am involved with a lot. I'm trying to finish a couple books. One is a novel about Nick Savage, Private Eye, the private detective here in Seattle in 1947. And then I'm also in the studio finishing up an EP for the band, MTC and the Rebel Saints. And then I've got uh, my friend's band, the Black Tones. That's Eva Walker, Cedric and Eva. They're twins, male and female. Um, but they, and they, so you can imagine, you know, how well they play together because they, they're just from the same blood so uh the black tones are great they have a great rocking uh show that is really connected to the crowd uh the crowds really love them they they are kind of like the new up-and-coming you know they're like seattle's new beatles Shh, don't tell too many people that but we yeah, will we will look into big. that hey i want to i want to yeah. start with this with this issue because we don't have a chance uh too much to uh, see what you saw when you were uh, witnessing something like uh, the Fort Lewis stop where um, military police boarded the bus, you were on there and forced everyone to show their ID. Uh, as you say, it, it seemed like a third world uh, dictatorship search. Um, talk to me about what you saw that day and, and what is happening in Seattle. Again, a very progressive uh, city, um, you know, a uh, sanctuary city. You know, their, their Greyhound is being now forced to pay two point two million dollar settlement in a lawsuit for allowing immigration agents to sweep their buses uh give us some thoughts on that yes uh jeff i am here live in seattle um headed down to the water with the boat so if uh, the wind picks up and it gets a little bit stormy uh please let me know and i'll find a quick quiet place to duck into like we are right now but so yeah th- i was on a bus once um i was on the greyhound and there is a stop at Fort Lewis McCord Air Force Base, uh, Fort Lewis McCord Joint Base. And so, yeah, suddenly we pulled up at the station and these uh, military police got on, these MPs got on. And, yeah, they searched the bus. I mean, they were looking for somebody. I don't know if that person was AWOL or what was going on. But there is a station, I'm assuming so, there at Fort Lewis. Um where soldiers got on and off the Greyhound, the you know cheap way to travel across the country. So I was shocked. Yeah, I th- I was thinking this is crazy. They're obviously looking for someone, and so it did feel kind of like a third world dictatorship, you know, where there are no rights and people with guns rule. And I was shocked because that's relatively rare. I'm hoping um, from a civil point of view, 
uh, not from a military point of view, but from a civilian's point of view, that was a violation of the the wall that should be there between the military and law enforcement. And just why we have things like the Posse Comitatus Act and stuff like that. It's one of the reasons. But same thing with the immigration officials. So Greyhound got sued in Washington State. There were immigration employees who were sweeping the buses. They were searching the buses and trying to find people to drag off who were um, considered undocumented. So, yeah, it caused a problem. And all I can say, Jeff, is that if my experience and, uh, you know, after paying two... $2.2 $2.2 million settlement in this case, which is getting a lot of publicity up here. If that's a lesson to Greyhound, then I hope they've learned their lesson and they need to realize that um, when you're on a, a, a Greyhound bus, you have the same rights as everyone else. And just like, you know, when you're crossing the border, you should have the same rights as guaranteed in the U.S. Constitution. But unfortunately, that doesn't always happen. And Seattle is supposed to be a very progressive place. Washington State is known as, you know, mostly progressive area. And to see that happen here is really sad and disappointing. I mean, whenever, you know, Washington State does something like that, like, uh, or people in Washington State do things like that, it makes the whole state look bad. So that's a business that still has some offices throughout Seattle, Tacoma, uh, Olympia area, and Portland, those kind of places, Centralia. But they've also, Greyhound long ago, got rid of a lot of their local stops. Um, yeah. So... If you live in a small town, forget it. They're not going to be anywhere near you. You have to live in a city. And that's the way it's been for a while. So people from smaller rural areas, they have to catch a ride or hitchhike or whatever into some town in order to catch a Greyhound to, you know, Yakima, Washington or something. So, Well, that's why you need some more rail, but you don't have going east to west, right? You don't. You have it going north to south, I believe, through the Cascades. But I don't think you have it going east to west, right? Well, there is some, yes, but... But Amtrak also was highly, let's say, truncated. I guess that would be an appropriate word for railroads. Um, years ago, when that's true, yep. you know, the government subsidies, you know, there were there were complaints from the Republicans, as usual, and the conservatives about that um, pushing back. I just can't imagine though cutting back on any more rail in the United States. We are just we are a third world country when it comes to our intercontinental uh, rail system. Uh, it's used for, you know, oil trains that are miles long and coal and all sorts of freight. But, um, you know, you know, in the, the shipping containers that come off of the freighters coming here from China and other places, but it's not used. Oh, here we have a, a nicer spot where it's quieter. Uh, but we do not have a decent rail system. I can tell you that it is a beautiful ride from Vancouver uh, down to Portland, say, on the... Um, on the Amtrak here, they do have. Oh yeah, no, I've, uh, I've, I've that through the Cascade Mountains is the, one of the most picturesque in the United yeah. States and around the world. Now I've taken that one. It ends up in San Francisco, or technically Emeryville, doesn't actually go into the city, which is another another issue that Amtrak needs to reform. And you know, bringing that into what we're talking about with this infrastructure bill, the the bipartisan one, you know, they cut out a lot of the good things that could be in there. And again. Yeah, maybe it's a start, but the problem is is that you want to go for everything you possibly can. As our good friend Larry Korb would say, you know, the first year you can get things done. It, it's too much tougher after that. You don't know. Republicans could take over the Congress in 2022 and zero gets done. Before we let go, before we, um, you know, uh, talk uh, on a negative side about the uh, state of Washington, which, of course, has more conservative places, particularly in the eastern part with Spokane and all, uh, there is uh, some good things in the city of Seattle. The city divested about $3.3 billion from big corporate banks, putting those funds in smaller banks. And uh, you also uh, talk about um, your city councilor, uh, Mike O'Brien, one of the first uh, officials to divest from uh, from Chase and Bank of America after you and, and other folks were protesting there. Talk to me about that. That's a good story uh, to go more local. Yeah, well... You know, there was a, a divestment um, movement across the country, largely influenced by the Occupy Wall Street movement, where these corporate banks like J.P. Morgan Chase, and I can't believe we're still repeating that guy's name. I mean, how long ago did he leave us? Anyway, J.P. Morgan Chase and um, and Bank of America were targets of that. And at the time, Bank, um, Bank of America, and I know because I had a Bank of America account, they were charging huge fees. So you know, there was a lot of money at the end of the month that was going to Bank of America that w- was coming out of my account. I was getting kind of tired of it. 
And then, you know, their overdraft fees were incredibly expensive and just kind of kept boomeranging. So after a while, I said, forget it. And I went down with a group of people to Pike Place Market during a protest. I actually went inside of a Chase Bank um, dressed in a suit and tie and uh, mm-hmm. while other people were outside protesting and um, basically posed as a potential client. And, uh, you know, and I asked them what their corporate statement was on the big bailout, the big public bailout that the taxpayers gave them. And uh, at first, the bank manager told me, oh, we didn't want that money, you know. And then I said, oh, well, that's interesting because I'd like to see an, an official corporate statement on that. And then, of course, you know, she contacted corporate and corporate said, we have no official statement, you fool. And then they realized I was a protester. <laughs> but I was not about to open my uh, an account at Chase because the bank that I did open my account with, which was Home Street Bank, which is a local bank in Seattle. But it's been around for a long time, like 100 years, but it's a local bank. The Seahawks bank with them. Um, but they, well, that's awesome. Um, yeah, that's the way to support your community. Man. That, that is the that is the right way to do it, and and, and it's so so important yeah, that they, you can, you can do that. They will take your bank card. They will take your bank card if you have a Chase. This is why Bank of America and Chase hate them. They will take your Chase or Bank of America card. If you walk into their branch, they will take out some scissors and cut it in half and give you fifty bucks. That's how much they are anti big bank and so anyway the city of seattle i went down to pike place market i burned my bank of america card because i saw these images of uh uh, of anti-vietnam war draft resistors you know burning their draft cards and i thought this is going to be a great image and sure enough it was in published in the washington post my name my photo doing it it was on cbs news it was all over the place Suddenly, by the end of that day, hundreds of people had cut up their bank cards, because it's a lot easier, by the way, to cut up a bank card than it is to burn it, because it takes a long time, and it's kind of toxic by the time it starts to burn. But it, people would cut up their bank cards, so there were big piles of cut up Chase and um, Bank of America cards outside these bank branches in Seattle. And that started a, a whole divestment movement. Our city council member, talk about progressives, uh, Mike O'Brien, uh, one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet, uh, he, he was a city council member at that time. And he was one of the first public officials to go public and say, I'm divesting all of my personal money from these banks. And then the city of Seattle decided to do it themselves. And at first they had a hard time because they basically put their, uh, their funds up for bid and said, who can handle, you know, $3.3 billion. And uh, none of the smaller banks could do it at first. They were like, oh, we don't know how because, you know, we don't have those, those kinds of investments. So eventually they built a system to where they were able to use um, other banks other than the, the big corporate bailout banks. They divested $3.3 billion, largely well, that's through great. the uh, auspices of the C- Seattle City Council. So that was well, a story that I wrote about at Truth Out. And, um, that's I, that's I, fantastic. I, 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 I want to I get to John in Minneapolis uh, here, but I, I want to get a couple more things out, then we'll get to, uh, to some music stuff, and I know John has some questions on, on, on that. Uh, there's the Carpenters' strike, and this want finally getting some uh, some you know um, understanding and congratulations on her legislative success, particularly on the six months uh, notice for rent increases. Uh, that's a lot better than a lot of places get. Well, regardless of the conservative business interests who have tried to launch a recall campaign against her, she's actually the most effective. Uh, city council member in terms of legislation. She was behind the $15 an hour minimum wage, even if, when it was down there in SeaTac, Washington, where it first started. She was still down there fighting for it. Now, you know, she's behind uh, issues like rent control and rental assistance. So, yes, she was able at this point to uh, get the city council to pass her, her sponsored legislation that requires a six month notice for substantial rent increases, which happens quite a bit here. And also, uh, it allows for relocation assistance for folks who need to move. The city basically will give you money to help you, you know, find another place. There's also another city-wide uh, program that people are applying for uh, for uh, hardship, if you know, because of the economic results of the lockdown from the pandemic. So um, there's also rental assistance there, and a lot of this has been enacted just within the last week or so, because uh, the moratorium on the Eviction mor- the eviction moratorium was lifted on September 30th, which was just the other day. So uh, now these are stopgap measures by folks like Shama Sawant. And she is getting support from the other progressive members of, of the city council. So it's looking good. They're trying you know, to do 
as much as they can to give a little bit of a cushion to the working class and the poor in the city. But I tell you, it's been a difficult battle with the corporate interest here. And uh, well, yeah, well, you got them I, there. I Amazon, you got uh, you got a couple of others. Of course, Microsoft is there, and uh, and Starbucks and so forth. Uh, just quickly, we won't take a call from my good friend uh, John in in Minneapolis, uh, uh, Mark. Uh, Dick's Drive-In uh, is doing some yeah. things. Their employees are starting at nineteen dollars an hour. They get medical yeah. insurance, three weeks vac- paid vacation. That's that's really impressive. Yeah, my friend Jerry Ashing was like featuring this on Facebook and LinkedIn and stuff because he was one of those guys that helped people pay off millions of dollars in medical debt. And by that's the way, fantastic. John Oliver was a major contributor to that. But that was a result of the Occupy Wall Street movement too, because people set up these. Uh, groups to try to get um, rid of medical debt and student debt and things, and they were very successful. They were able to get millions of dollars uh, of debt paid off. But, yeah, he was talking about this, and I've been talking about it for a long time, that in Seattle, Dick's Drive-In, which is a local regional chain, employees get $19 an hour. They get free medical insurance, three weeks paid vacation, which kind of sounds like Europe, uh, 50% 401k match, and $9,000 for tuition and child care credit. So, incredible. They also get uh, paid to volunteer for local uh, charities and and, um, and nonprofit groups. So, they actually get paid to be a good community member, which is a nice incentive. I mean, some of them, I'm sure, would do it anyway, but McDonald's should be ashamed. I'm telling you, if Dick's Drive-In can do that in Seattle, then a multi-billion dollar, multi-international, multinational corporation like McDonald's can surely do it, and much better, actually. No doubt about it. All right, with that, let's uh, let's go to the phones. Uh, I know our good friend uh, John has some uh, music questions for you. Go ahead, John. You're next with MTC. Yeah, uh, you know, this Dick's driving. and I heard about it also, and it'll probably help them sell much more hamburgers and even make more money, so it's all good. And it just goes to show you that uh, small, medium businesses could be very progressive, too, in their packages and how they treat employees. But what I wanted to ask you about was, I, you know, I've always loved uh, Joni Mitchell, and in my opinion, she was the greatest singer-songwriter of the of the century i really think that and she was so creative and is such a humble person too but she was uh she's also a, a fantastic artist since she did all her artwork on her albums when they were on vinyl and it was you know really amazing just absolutely amazing person and uh there's a documentary that's on youtube that i discovered uh, that is like an hour and a half, and it's just wonderful. I don't know what you think of her, but I, I absolutely love her as a singer songwriter and a lyricist and poet. Uh, she's like I don't well. Oh. She wrote Woodstock, you know. I mean, right. you know, right? right. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, no, I mean that's that an icon song. of the '60s for sure. Yeah, Go she ahead, has Mark. that song about being. She has that song about being a genius at the age of three or whatever, and it's true. I mean, she was a prodigy, an amazing woman. Uh, by the way, the Seattle Dicks drive-in, uh, you, were, you were mentioning um, the hamburgers. I am not a, a great fan of hamburgers, but I can tell you their milkshakes are really great. <laughs> and there's a, lot of cra- there's a lot of community loyalty. We were talking about this yesterday on Democracy Watch News' press briefing, that there are, there's a lot of loyalty to that company. People go there because they know that um, they treat their employees with respect. So why wouldn't you want to go... And, and get food. Is it sort of like the old that. IHOP kind of, you know, 1950s driving? Yeah, it's like okay. mom and dad, man. I mean, this goes back to the 50s. It's, it's, yeah. You almost want to, you know, you almost expect to see, you know, uh, women on roller skates, you know, delivering your food right. or something because it's the Bobby socks and all that. Some of them have outdoor seating. Some of them don't. So some of them are just totally drive through. It's just quick, fast food. And it's where everybody goes at the end of the night. Look, in Seattle, you've been out with your friends. You've had a couple beers, whatever. Go two places. You either go get pizza, and here it would be a Mario's Pizza because that's another local chain that's really good, and then you know, sort of New York style pizza, and then you have uh, the other option, you know, and that is to go somewhere like Dick's, where it's just quick, fast food, and sober up, you know, walk home, whatever, get a cab, but you want some food at some point in the night, and not everybody is open late at night in Seattle. There aren't a lot of restaurants. It's not like New York City where you can, you know, eat at 3 a.m. easily. You, you can in the international district. There's a lot of great 
Asian restaurants that are open until 3, 4 a.m. But uh, in downtown, you know, you have to search for that hot dog stand or that one all-night diner or something. We've loved Beth's here for a long time on Aurora Avenue, a classic where everybody loved to go there. And they would give you, even if you were an adult, they would give you something to, uh, to color and some crayons. And everybody would put their art up on the wall and stuff. It was a cool place. That, unfortunately, didn't make it through the pandemic. Not every... Uh, business did but Dix is one of those that's a traditional business that our parents went to and maybe even their parents at some point so it's a it, it's passed through generations and it, there's a huge loyalty here I had a friend who would drive all the way to Seattle from Olympia just to go to that drive-in but I'm not saying that they're the perfect company and that they've never <laughs> made mistakes or anything I'm just saying that as far as the way they treat their employees and the benefits that you get there for fast food it's just it should be the standard and it can be done there's no reason why if a small chain that doesn't have uh, the, the huge corporate investment that McDonald's has, you know, if they can do it, then of course McDonald's can do it. And they could, you know, they could pay people twice as much, three times as much. They're, they, they're rolling in the dough. Believe me, yeah. McDonald's is not hurting for cash. No. Hey, hey, Mark, I want to ask you about this because, you know, when I, when I, when I first uh, taught, thought drive-in, I was thinking of the movie theater or the movie, uh, you know, drive-in, right? Has there been, uh, you know, because of the fact that, uh, you know, you have you know a lot of uh, cloudy weather and so forth. When uh, the pandemic uh, happened in 2020, a lot of people started going to these drive-ins. Is that at all successful there in 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 Seattle Metro? Uh, you know the the actual you know big screen you know in in these uh, parking lots or whatever. Uh, you know the drive-in theater. It's not just the drive-in theater. There, it's not, there's not many of those left. By the way, before I forget. Um, my friend's band, the Black Tones, are playing tomorrow in Seattle on Pier 62, and that's going to be a great show. They are requiring proof of vaccination or a negative COVID test, just to let everybody know, even though it's an outdoor show. So they have, there have been more outdoor shows, but they still have the same restrictions as the indoor shows are, are having. The other thing is, is that people set up movie screens, and now these days you can get literally inflatable movie screens. They're kind of funny, but it doesn't take very long to set up, and you can put up a big screen in a park, or in, in this case, down at Seattle Center underneath the Space Needle at the Mural Amphitheater. Uh, I think it was KEXP, the, the radio station that normally had uh, concerts down there. This year they had a film series. So you can go outdoors, bring a picnic basket with your food or whatever, sit on the grass with your kids, whatever, watch a movie. And it's all those movies that everybody loves. And even the kids love, like, you know, The Princess Bride and Spinal Tap and all the crazy movies, you know, but ones that kids like to... So it's fun, you know, to go outside in a, in a non-rainy day in Seattle. We've had a few of those lately, but um, most of the time, you know, you can get away with outdoor shows here. And then the outdoor restaurants and bars have canopies or covering, so you can still sit outside. It does get to the point where it's so blustery and the wind is blowing the rain crossways across the patio that, you know, people just kind of go home. But uh, that's usually not, that usually doesn't hit us until around November. So we've got some time for that. I, I just wanted to ask you, so we got about 30 seconds here. Um, the the, uh, the Foo Fighters, um, you know, all over the place. And uh, Dave Grohl's got a new book. Is that right? Yeah, he's coming out with a book called Living Life Loud, which I love. That's because a great that's name. That's my, a great book author. That's that's great. I'd love to get him on the program, man. Yeah. I will make sure that you are... Uh, uh, on the show with me uh, on that time. Yeah, Have yourself a great weekend, for. man. You too, Jeff. Love you guys. Rock on. Rock on. You can check him out, Democracy Watch News, and on Twitter, Mark Taylor Canfield. He is the man. We'll talk to you next Friday, my friend. Have a great, wonderful yeah, check weekend. Yeah, check me out on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. See you next time. See you next time. Hey, I want to thank Ron Kreider for producing this broadcast. Uh, thank you all for contributing today. Great back and forth with all of our contributors. Great callers, best in the nation, great listeners as well. Thank you, folks. Have yourself a great weekend. Keep on fighting. Go Red Sox. Uh, go Brady. And uh, we'll be back on Monday. Same bad time, same bad channel. My name is Jeff Santos, and right now it is my time to say I got to go. 
With SRN News, I'm Keith Peters. A federal judge who sentenced a January 6th rioter to probation on Friday instead of a harsher punishment requested by prosecutors suggested that the United States Justice Department was being too hard on the January 6th defendants and it was not hard enough on those accused in police brutality protests from last summer. U.S. District Court Judge Trevor McFadden questioned why federal prosecutors had not brought more cases against those accused in protests last summer. The statements by McFadden were a major departure from other federal judges who sentenced rioters so far in the January 6th protests. On Wall Street, the Dow by 482 points. The Nasdaq rose 118. The S&P 500 advanced 49. Crude oil up 85 cents to close at $75.88 a barrel. This is SRN News.